Welcome everyone to tonight's uh, very special event. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many of you um, here tonight. Uh, just, I'm um, Professor Chad Dolan. I'm Associate Dean of Research for the School of Health Life Sciences. It's an absolute privilege and honour to be able to present our special professorial lecture tonight, um, will be delivered by Professor Andy McCauley. It's, again, um, and what we'll do, the order of um, events, I'm going to give a little introduction to Andy. First, we'll tell you a wee bit about our professorial lecture series um, and the purpose of it. Then Andy will speak for um, 40 minutes. <laughs> now, he's, he's told me that um, he doesn't normally get as long to speak. Um, it's really exciting that he's got such a long time. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be ringing a bell in 40 minutes um, if, he, if he goes over his time. But then we will have some time at the end for some question and answer um, session. I'm sure that'll be a lively session. And then we'll proceed to an even livelier uh, drinks reception. <laughs> Um, so just first of all, let me start with um, the purpose of our profes professorial lecture series. So the professorial lecture series reflects the public role of universities, um, which for GCU is a university for the common good, is about how research and teaching contributes to the sustainable development goals. Um, these were issued by the United Nations in 2015. Within the School of Health and Life Sciences, um, we also have our a dedicated research centre, this is called Beach, which is the, the research centre for health, um, and that's what Andy works within that um, research centre. We're really proud of the research we do at GCU, um, in particular our health research. Um, it contributes to um, our reputation within GCU, and we're a, a leader in health research. And the research we do um, makes a huge difference and a positive impact to people's lives. So the professorial lecture provides an opportunity for recently promoted professors to showcase their work and their career achievements to colleagues, research collaborators, friends and family. And I'd like to extend a real special welcome tonight to Andy's family. He's joined um, by Adrian, his wife, and his son Evan here. Um, he's also got a daughter Anna who's um, rather got your name all <laughs>
Oh, <coughs> another peer milestone this week you heard that he's actually achieved his 100th um, peer reviewed publication. So, again, you'll agree that that's a fantastic achievement. He's also been commissioned to write a number of reports for renowned World Health Organization and the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction. And in recognition of his contribution to the field, he has also been awarded the Fred Yates Prize for Researcher of the Year. Um, and this is from the Society for the Study of Addiction. So on a personal note, as I said, um, Andy's um, from Airdrie, which is um, of real interest to me. <laughs> what is that? So he's from Airdrie, he still lives in Airdrie with his family. Um, and the reason I wanted to highlight that is because I have fellow Adrianian. <laughs> I know a number of you get to hear her from Adrian as well. Now, I was really delighted this morning, I didn't realise this, but I um, chatted to Andy about tonight's event and I actually realised we actually went to the same high school as well. So, it's a real testimony to our first generation um, students. So, I should congratulate each other here. <laughs>
this uh, presentation tonight. I thought long and hard about this presentation tonight, and it is slightly terrifying presenting in front of friends and family, but um, I really made up so many of them came along. This is quite a long picture of me and my family in the bottom left here, but I didn't want to give away this slide, and this was the only one I had in my possession, but I think this one's from 1992, uh, so hopefully we can maybe update that uh, in the course of tonight. Now, Sharon's helpfully outlined uh, my job. My job's slightly different. There are a few of us who have fulfilled this kind of academic type role we've got here at GCU, where we both have a practitioner role uh, and we have an academic role. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because Sharon's helpfully introduced that I do split my time uh, between Public Health Scotland and the GCU. And having that foot in both camps uh, sometimes does feel like two full time jobs, but it's really been beneficial to me uh, in my career in terms of the opportunity to given me. And one of the bonuses about working across two different organisations and across lots of different teams as you get to work with lots of really nice, talented and friendly and fun people. And this is just a snapshot of all the kind of guys we work with across the teams. There's quite a few of them here tonight, which again I'm really grateful for them taking time to come out and support me tonight. But one of the reasons I really enjoy my job is I really enjoy the people I work with. And uh, I wouldn't swap them for anything. And it's quite hard to find that in life, the job that you enjoy. And I'm, I'm quite privileged uh, to have that. So yeah, just to say thanks to everybody for, for all the support, because uh, we really are uh, a really solid team. Okay, I also wanted to just clarify about the, the field that we work in, because not everybody will be familiar with public health or epidemiology. Uh, so public health is effectively the, the science and art preventing disease or problem in life, promoting health. And public health is different to what you might imagine a GP or a surgeon would do, we're focused on the individual patient. In public health, we're focused on populations or community level health. And that's essentially the difference. And there are three domains in public health, be health improvement, health protection and health services. And the work we do in public health is, is epidemiology, so it's the study of how often diseases occur in different groups and why, and also we use this information to plan and evaluate different responses to prevent uh, illness uh, and infection and disease. Uh, and that's largely uh, where our work has been concentrated over the last 20 years. Now, the population that I work in or the community that I work in tends to be people who use drugs or more specifically inject drugs. Uh, we cut across both, but we'll focus more on the injective side today. And it's safe to say that I didn't grow up wanting to be a public health epidemiologist working on injective <laughs> drug use. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't my dream as a child. Uh, but this is, the, this is the field I found myself in, and it's a fascinating field. Uh, it's a very dynamic field, it's very interesting. There's lots of things going on all the time, it's never dull. Uh, and it's important to remind ourselves that injecting drug use is not a new phenomenon. People have been injecting drugs for hundreds of years. But in Scotland, the injecting drug use phenomenon, the injecting drug use culture we know of today, really kicked in uh, in the 1980s. I think this point I may be working. Yes, yeah, so you can see these graphs here. This is England at the top, and this is Scotland at the bottom. And this is instances, this is trends in new people starting to inject drugs. And you can see this onset from the early 1980s when uh, heroin came in from Afghanistan, cheap heroin flooded the UK at a time where mass unemployment was occurring through deindustrialisation policies. So we had this large cohort starting to emerge of people injected drugs and it began to, to increase before it, it peaked in the mid to late 1980s and then it's tailed off ever since. And this is important because the bulk of people we're dealing with are people who've been injecting drugs for a long period of time. That doesn't mean we don't get new people injecting drugs in recent years, of course we do, but the majority have got no longer term habits. And you can just see, see here some of the initial responses to the injecting drug use epidemics of the 80s from this on the left, which from the Scottish government, it's quite a positive approach to it, and then you've got from the UK government, it's a bit more of a doomsday approach to it, so it's interesting to see even from, from that point in time they were approaching it quite differently. Now, uh, people who use drugs or people who inject drugs, uh, Unfortunately, but as a result of that, do suffer drug-related harms. And drug-related harms can be both direct and indirect. So the direct harms tend to be more related to the morbidity, so things like uh, physical health or mental health. And also, of course, uh, drug use is associated with an increased risk of death, so mortality is a key feature as well. And through the course of this presentation, we'll really focus on the morbidity and the mortality aspects. That's not to say that indirect harms, particularly affecting families or wider communities don't happen and are not important. Uh, but we're really just going to focus on this today because the bulk of my research has been in that top tier. Mm -hmm. 
So, as I said, I didn't always grow up wanting to be an epidemiologist in this field. I wanted to be a footballer like my dad. So this is my dad on the right hand side here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would tell everybody and anybody I knew when I was younger that my dad used to be a professional footballer. It was something I was really proud of. And still am very proud of. Uh, and I just love this picture of my dad. He's playing against Harry Hood of Celtic here. He's actually getting skinned on the right hand side. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wasn't very good. <laughs> he, didn't, uh, he didn't give me his left foot either. Uh, so then I proceeded to my next interest when I was a kid. Um, I, I always wanted to be a journalist. Uh, and some of my friends would tell me I'm still trying to pursue a career in tabloid headline reading. <laughs> I, I like a pun from now and again. But yeah, uh, I did harbour uh, ambitions to be a journalist and I actually applied to Strathclyde to do journalism in a life school, but I got rejected <laughs> <laughs> because I did really terribly on my SYS English exam like for a call at the time, so I, I didn't get in, so I had to rethink my career choices quite quickly at that point. But Strathclyde's loss was GCU's gain because I did get accepted to do a, an honours degree here at GCU in what was called Public Administration and Management, which is quite a long-winded title of a social science degree generally which I did at GCU between 1996 and 2000. This is what GCU looked like back then. It's not the fancy campus you find yourself on uh, these days. It was a bit more barren back then. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I found myself into that degree uh, more, more or less by chance, really. But I actually had a great time here at GCU. This is me on my graduation day uh, in the year 2000. And uh, we ended up having quite a small class, but uh, again, by chance, it was, it was filled with people with very similar interests, whether it was to do with sport or whether it was to do with music. We had a very, very uh, small group who got on uh, generally very well together. And we actually still meet the core group of that class, still meet a couple of times a year, even after all this time in 20 years' time. So you can decide yourself who time has been better to. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's me or Nick, I think Fraser's still. That was a really good group to, to learn with and a good group to stay in contact with. But this has been my career path to professor and this is what I'll explain the bulk of the presentation talking about today. So some people have a very linear path to professorship. The career academics come in and do their degree, their PhD, and then they go straight up the ladder to it. Mine's has been a bit busier than that and I'll try to explain uh, how I got there over the next half hour. And I hope I've got half hour sure. Uh, so I did leave university and I had a couple of kind of low-level jobs actually working in Glasgow City Council and then in the third sector with Alex Amor Scotland. And these were just really good jobs to get me to learn to work as part of a team and within an office and, and also to understand the challenges that people face working in the public sector or the third sector. So they gave me really good grounding. But it really was the job I took in 2001 in Barton with the, the Lone Dark Herald Trustee. And this was my first job in the NHS. And I worked as an analyst with the prescribing team there. And I think this was really the first proper step uh, towards my professorship at that time. This was actually my first NHS job, and I think as was last year, I'm um, 23 years in the NHS, so I think I may get a carriage club within the next couple of years uh, to celebrate uh, my service. But yeah, that, this is where I started. And one feature of what I've done over time is I've always been keen to take advantage of further educational opportunities. So back in this decade, maybe not so much recently, but there was always resources about to let you go and do further education. Uh, so when I was in this job, I actually did a part-time postgraduate diploma in, in IT here at, at GCU, actually, at the time. My current colleagues were wondering to teach your postgrad in IT. He's homeless at IT. But I did get that uh, diploma uh, at that time before I became a dinosaur, which I am now. Uh, and yeah, that was, a, that was a great job uh, down in Dumbarton. I didn't enjoy the travel, though, I have to say. Uh, I was there for about 18 months, then I moved back closer to home, back to Lanarkshire. Uh, and I took a job at the Bristol General Hospital. Uh, and again, it was another analytical type job, but this time working with cancer data. So we worked with the uh, cancer consultants, we would audit their data, and it was my first introduction to survival analysis. We would do lots of survival analysis on different types of cancer, and that's an analytical technique or method that stayed with me through time and something we still use to this day. 
And there's me and my show General Hospital. This was the first photo I could find of a team that I walked in. You can see it's not very high raised back then. <laughs> uh, and that was the days where we all wore a shirt and tie to work in the hospital. <laughs> uh, but yeah, working in the hospital environment, anybody who's worked in a hospital environment, it, it's just such a dynamic place to work. There's always something going on. There's so many different people working in it, uh, different disciplines. And yeah, I absolutely loved uh, my time there. That was, that was one of the most enjoyable working experiences and I think Lucy, I'm not sure if Lucy's here tonight, but she uh, still kind of keeps in contact with lots of PHS and her careers have taken similar trajectories uh, since then. But I moved from uh, the, the cancer of the team in Lanarkshire to another post in Lanarkshire. Uh, this is really my first step into the, the admissions world or the, the world of uh, people who use drugs. And it was with uh, the EDAT, so this is the Alcohol and Drug Action Team. And my title there was Reception and Information Officer. It was again, it was another analytical focused post. And you can see here, more opportunity for further education. And I did my master's uh, <coughs> part time uh, while uh, I worked in that post. And there is the Lancaster Alcohol and Drug Action Team. So this is us, I think this is my final day here when we were based at Cove Hill Hospital in Coatbridge. Uh, and a few of those guys are here tonight, so it's, it's nice that they've, they've come along uh, tonight and kept in touch with a few of them over time. Uh, and when I joined that team, one of the first things they asked me to work on was a project involving drug-related deaths. And little did I know at that time that this would be a thing that would be a feature of my career really for the next 20 years. But when I joined that team, I didn't know what a drug-related death was. I didn't know any different to any other common man in society. My knowledge of drug-related deaths was through popular media, through culture, and at the time, the most high-profile drug-related death in the press uh, was Paul Yates at that time, <coughs> which we've overdosed recently, uh, just before I took that job. So uh, it was a kind of steep learning curve for me initially to try and understand what it was they were asking me to work on. To me, it was just another data source at that time. So I thought it was important to clarify what we mean by drug-related deaths, because anybody new to the field has their own impressions about what we might uh, be talking about here. And really when we talk about drug-related deaths, we're talking about the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, the type of mortality that people who use drugs experience. And we're talking mainly about accidental models. So we're talking about people who use drugs who have no intention of dying, but for one reason or another, uh, they succumb to the consumption of drugs that they're using at that time. Now that's not to say that there's not a lot of other deaths associated with drug use. And of course there are, whether it's to do with violence or suicide or bloodborne viruses or cancers. Uh, but it's just to help say when we're talking about drug related deaths either tonight or when you see them mentioned in the press or any country by country comparisons, we're generally talking about the accidental overdose deaths. The other deaths form part of other uh, investigations or other uh, research groups. So at the time I joined the Lanarkshire uh, Alcohol and Drug Action Team, this was 2005, this was the trend in drug related deaths in Scotland. So you could see the trend was going up slowly uh, and we had hit around 350 deaths. And the headlines at that time were generally one person dies every day from drug related deaths in Scotland. That was the headlines. But it's important to acknowledge the press didn't cover a huge amount in those days. It was very sparse. Uh, the media coverage uh, of this issue compared to what it is today, uh, for example. And the substances that were involved were very consistent from year to year. It was never a single substance that killed anyone, it was generally a combination of substances, what we would call polydrug use. And the polydrug combinations were usually an opioid of some sort, so heroin, morphine, or methadone, and then in combination with diazepam and alcohol. So a kind of, this kind of triple down nerve combination of all depressant drugs which were uh, combining uh, to contribute to people's increased risk of overdose. Cocaine wasn't as much of a feature of deaths at that time. <coughs> and although there wasn't a huge amount of media attention, actually there was policy attention at that time because drug-related deaths had reached their highest levels before, and that was enough for the Scottish Government to commission this forensic investigation into drug-related deaths to try and understand what was going on and to try and come up with prevention strategies. You can see a few familiar names of the authorship. Sharon's been working on this certainly a lot longer than I have, uh, and she was part of that team. Now, I don't want to go through all the implications and conclusions of the implications, but the main thing that came out of that report was uh, that the drug related deaths in Scotland were preventable largely, and there was things that could be done to try and increase uh, the preventative chances of people responding to these and getting them down. 
Now, in Lanarkshire, the interest in drug-related deaths was similar to Scotland, was because deaths were going up, but perhaps a wee bit more acutely in Lanarkshire. Obviously, the scale is completely different here. It's about a tenth of what we see in Scotland. But you could see between 1996 and 2005, uh, they had increased fourfold over that period, so there was concern in the large about what was going on, and largely the pattern was similar in terms of the types of drugs that were involved in drug related deaths then. And one of the interventions that was proposed to try and address uh, deaths in large at that time uh, was the uh, use of a drug called naloxone. So, naloxone is uh, it's not a new drug, and naloxone has been used in emergency medicine since the 1970s. But there was a proposal to actually give naloxone out to people who use drugs for them to use it within their communities because they are usually the first responders at overdose before professionals can arrive. And essentially what naloxone is, uh, naloxone is it's really a harmless drug. It won't do anything if you administer it to anybody who's not using opioids. But for people who are using opioids, it temporarily removes the opioid from the receptors in the brain. So if somebody, for example, injects heroin, the opioid binds itself to the receptor in the brain. Uh, if they look as if they're going into an overdose state, you can administer naloxone and it'll bounce the opioid off uh, for a short period of time, generally about 10 to 20 minutes. And that 10 to 20 minutes gives you a window for you to phone the ambulance, get them out and to assist in the recovery of the patient. Now, there's lots of ways to explain naloxone to lay audiences. This is my way to explain it. Naloxone is like, attack, uh, uh, like attacking a bonfire with a domestic fire extinguisher. You might be able to put all the main flames out, but you won't be able to put the fire out underneath it, and you'll have to phone the fire brigade to come out and finish the job. Naloxone does the same kind of thing for an overdose, but you'll have to phone the ambulance service to come out and finish the job. So the, the concept of giving naloxone would the concept became known as take home naloxone, giving it out to drug users to be the first responders and save the lives of their friends and family. It was first proposed by John Strang and colleagues back in 1996. And it was really probably first picked up by the late Dan Fink and Sarge Maxwell in Chicago in the USA. Uh, now they used to run an organisation called the Chicago Recovery Alliance. This was a harm reduction organisation. They would, they would go out in their community in this van and they would offer various different harm reduction services to drug users to reduce the risk of health harms. And on this van, they would train people in overdose identification and response. They would train them in the Lotsome administration and they would give them the Lotsome kits out. Now at the time, this was underground, unlicensed activity, so they were really operating within uh, quite, in their area, quite dangerous circles in terms of what they're doing for potential fear of prosecution. But they really trailblazed the pathway for everybody else that came after them because the, the results of their, their work really showed that there were no unintended consequences with what they were doing. There was no harm came about it and actually they were able to show reduction in deaths uh, in their area of Cook County in Illinois. So uh, following that, another breakthrough was the legal barrier was lifted. So prior to 2005, the cost of Luxon was a prescription only medicine it could only be administered by health professionals, it couldn't be administered by you and I, or we could be prosecuted for administering it. But this amendment to the, the legislation at that time meant that if I was walking down the street and seeing somebody overdosing and there was an aloxone kit next to them, I could pick it up and administer it without fear of prosecution. So this was a game changer really. So this, alongside the evidence we have from Chicago and other places, led these kind of policy eh, bodies to, to recommend aloxone pilots be rolled out across the country whenever they needed. So spurred on by our, our colleagues in the US and by legislative change, <coughs> eh, there was almost a gunfire and there was a race started to see who could be the first naloxone pilot in Scotland. And I think it's fair to say there was healthy competition about who could lay claim to have the first naloxone pilot, not just in Scotland, but in the UK. So Lisa Ross eh, led the naloxone pilot in Burness. Carl, who was here tonight, led the naloxone pilot in Glasgow at the time. And it was actually Maureen Woods who led the naloxone pilot in uh, Lanarkshire with me ably assisting her. But Maureen is the hardest person to Google when we get a picture of. <laughs> she she uh, told me tonight that's deliberate, so we couldn't get a picture of two, we just got that ugly of you up there to, to signify uh, Lanarkshire. But yeah, all three of us kind of started at roughly the same time. Uh, and one of the biggest issues we faced at that time, which is still an ongoing issue, I think, with naloxone, 
uh, is the product and carriage of naloxone because if naloxone is going to be effective, you have to have it on you when somebody's overdosing. If you don't have it on you, if it's in the house or if it's behind a bin shed or whatever, it's no use to put it on you. So the product that we were working with at the time was the mini jet, Steve, you'll remember the mini jet. Uh, at the time, it wasn't great, it wasn't very portable, it wasn't very durable, and we couldn't actually think about giving this out to people because we thought it would just break down uh, and all the equipment would be lost. Oh, need to go back. So I got in my car and started going around Larkshire trying to think about how could we keep all this equipment in the one place, and the idea we came up with was a spectacle case. So I eventually found myself in spectacles and Airdrie, and I bought 30 of these units <laughs> uh, because they fitted the naloxone, not just the naloxone kit, but the other part of the area, the, the swabs, uh, the wipes and the needles that we needed with it to go in there. And we packaged it all in there, we gave people an ID number and a little phone number if anybody found it to return it. And that became the product we used in Lanarkshire. That product is far more sophisticated now, thanks to Stephen and his colleagues' work. Uh, but that's where it all started really for us in Lanarkshire. I think it was a different product in Glasgow, but that, that was our Lanarkshire one. And this is us training people uh, in Lanarkshire at the time, I think this is 2007 each morning. So there was two training sessions. There was one for professionals at the time who were working with people at risk of overdose. That's this one. And then there was other training for people who use drugs and their bodies. So we asked them to bring a body with them because if they overdosed and had a naloxone kit, they were never going to self-administer the drugs. But if they had a body who knew uh, how to identify it, how to administer the kit, then the body could be there to perform the rescue. So that was the sessions and the way we ran it. And the outcome for us in Lanarkshire was this paper. And I've just put this up because this was my first ever first author scientific paper. It horrifies me about when I go back and read it. It's not my greatest piece of work. <laughs> uh, but still something I'm quite proud of because it was the first time I had published in a scientific journal uh, and it really encapsulated everything we'd done through that project. So what did we find? Well, this was a very small pilot project at the time. Uh, we trained 23 uh, trainees and 18 bodies, and at the end of the training we gave out 19 naloxone kits. And we followed these people up for six months, and over the course of six months they reported three overdoses had been witnessed, and they reported that naloxone had been administered on two occasions during those six months. And crucially for us, the ambulance service and the police service were able to validate those administrations. They had attended those incidents and said yes, this did happen. Uh, and self-report is a thing in our field, people don't trust what drug users say, so validation always has to come into it. But if you look at all the validation studies, they always come out and show that drug users generally tell you the truth. Uh, they don't uh, lie to you the way people would assume uh, they do, and it's one of the stigmas that exists in the area we work in. Uh, and then also, after six months, we managed to follow the vast majority of people, and they also still had their naloxone kit on their possession. Now, I, I still look at this a bit of dread, the way we tackled this paper in terms of responsible management. It's very paternalistic, but the reason we did that was there was a lot of moral panic at the time. We did this work about, why are you giving drug users this? They're going to use it as a weapon on each other. They're going to use more drugs. They're going to have naloxone parties and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of moral panic exists in this field a lot, and we had to disprove all these myths. And these myths have continued to be disproved over eh, time. And a combination of our work in Lanarkshire, the work in Glasgow and the work in Inverness led to this becoming a national programme. So the work so went from these very, very small scale pilots to national policy and the national programme was launched in 2011. Uh, and yeah, Carl, myself and others, including Lisa, were asked to go on the advisory group and help design uh, and implement this programme which was taken up by Stephen initially and then Kirsten and Jason and others and rolled out nationally. Something that was quite lucky, it was the first thing I worked on making policy, and I thought this is easy. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, things have not been quite as successful as how that went, but uh, yeah, something that was a really great thing to be proud of at the time and to see how it's developed. And my God, it's developed over time. Uh, we, that national programme is now 13 years old or so. It's involved national campaigns, it's informed the mm. WHO guidance on opioid overdose. Police are now carrying the locks on as part of a standard first aid kit, which is another another thing we would never have envisaged 10 or 15 years ago. And I think I seen Susie earlier, uh, even you yourself now, if you want a locks on kit, you can go online, complete a short training session, and it'll be delivered to your door. 
Uh, so things have come leaps and bounds since the since our kind of very small work back in our pilot back then. So uh, <coughs> I moved at this point after that from Lanarkshire uh, to my first uh, job nationally, which was at NHS Health Scotland. And again, more for their education. I was a club for punishment at this point. Mark, my friend, didn't say they just like student discounts, and I would never leave. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I moved on to do my PhD uh, at UWS. So at this point, I had my GCU undergrad, I had my Glasgow Uni Masters, I had my UWS PhD. So I was just one short of getting the, the Glasgow suite from Strathclyde. But Adrian was at Strathclyde, so I think that probably counts for that. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the first national job I got at Health Scotland was much more of a strategic job, so until then I'd be working much more operationally in terms of what I was doing. So this was really a step change uh, in the type of work I was doing and the people I was working with. Uh, and again, quite a steep learning curve for me, but I worked initially under Andrew Tannerhill uh, and then subsequently under Jerry McCarthy and uh, they were really good people to work under uh, to, to kind of teach me uh, the kind of right methods and how to navigate those fields because it's very different working with policy makers than it is working at the operational level that requires a different, a different skill set, which I definitely didn't have when I joined uh, that job. And that's the various different Health Scotland people. I couldn't find pub, uh, pictures that weren't in the pub for Health Scotland, <laughs> uh, This was again quite a social team, and we spent a lot of time uh, out in pubs, and yeah, I had a really great time working there, and met a lot of, kind of lifelong friends there. Quite a few of them have now emigrated to Australia, so maybe that says more about, <laughs> about them. Uh, but yeah, a really great time uh, working there. But in terms of injecting drug use, this period between really 2010 and 2014 was quite an important period because things began to change. So earlier I talked about this kind of consistency we had in the types of substances people were taking, really the kind of triple downers, the, the heroin, the diet of and the alcohol. But at this point, we started to see a shift. And the shift we seen was the emergence of what was called the novel psychoactive substances, or NPS. Now, the UN gave quite a dry definition of it, but what we came to know it as uh, in the communities was legal highs. And they were called legal highs because you could buy them on the high street, and they weren't marketed as drugs, they were marketed as other products. Maybe not quite everyday products, but they certainly were mar marketed as illegal <coughs> products. And these are some of the substances that were available at that time. People might remember methadone when it came out, which became an alternative to ecstasy or MDMA for people at that time. Uh, spice for certain populations became an alternative to cannabis uh, at that time. And the key thing that connected these NPS type substances was that the drugs that they were brought in to mimic uh, or replace uh, were not as harmful as these substances. These substances were much more harmful. And we didn't know that initially, but we began to realise that as more and more people started to use these substances. Now, NPS injecting followed NPS use. So often that happens when a new drug culture arrives. People use it in different ways, and then, particularly in Scotland, an injecting culture emerges from that. Uh, and the injecting culture that emerged from NPS was related to a drug called Ethylphenidate. Uh, Ethylphenidate was an analogue of methylphenidate, which you <coughs> might was the drug Ritalin, which is prescribed for uh, uh, different conditions. And Ethylphenidate really caught a bit of a footprint in the east of the country, so particularly in Edinburgh City. And the key features of that was it was injected, uh, and it was injected by people who were traditionally injecting drugs like heroin. And the reason mainly they switched to that initially was its availability and affordability. It was readily available at the time, and it was readily affordable at the time. And people might remember around right about 2010-11, there was a bit of a heroin drought in the UK, so that also created a window for people to experiment with other substances. Uh, but it came in, people started using this drug, and because it was a stimulant, which if you remember heroin, it's like a depressant drug downer, uh, people inject that maybe two or three times a day, this is a stimulant drug that wears off much quicker, so people are injecting this much more frequently. And in some cases, people are injecting this 20, 25 times a day. It's a really extreme injecting behaviour with this. Uh, and when people are injecting so frequently, their, their risk behaviours increase, so they're, they're less likely to use freshening equipment in every episode. Uh, injecting equipment sharing occurs, reuse occurs, and that increases people's risk of 
of both virus acquisition and also skin and soft tissue infections. So apologies for this picture, this is probably the only kind of picture I'm going to show, but this is the sort of thing that started to emerge in Lothian at that time. Uh, people were experiencing really extreme skin and soft tissue infections, but they were also experiencing amputations, uh, acute psychosis, and in some cases people were uh, dying of these drugs. This is from a published paper, so uh, the people have consented to the use of these pictures. So, uh, this phenomenon was fairly short-lived in Edinburgh because there was quite an aggressive response to it. The response was both legislative and also uh, involved in enhanced harm reduction response. And this is just a, a selection of some of the research uh, that was involved. Alan was in here tonight led the paper looking at the, the impact of the legislative response, which is one of the rare examples where a legislative response was actually positive uh, in this area. And we also did a paper which showed that even uh, something like Hep C, which has been quite flat in that area for a while, uh, increased over a, a very short space of time. But really, this was our first insight to kind of new culture of injecting drug use that was using different drugs, and actually people who hadn't traditionally used stimulants were now moving to, to use these drugs and be interested in these drugs as an alternative to the drugs they had used before. So, uh, after leaving Health Scotland, I got a promotion, which actually meant I moved just one floor down. And this is when I joined Health Protection Scotland. Uh, and I'm still technically there, even though we've kind of morphed into Public Health Scotland, I'm still in the same team. Uh, and this was when I moved into the Public Health Domain of Health Protection. Uh, so, I had worked in Health Protection before. Health Protection is probably like the clinical side of Public Health. Uh, and the team I found myself in was the Bloodborne Virus team. Now the reason I know this post is bloodborne viruses are Hep C, HIV, and Hep B, uh, and the main route of acquisition for bloodborne viruses is the sharing of contaminated injector equipment. So they mainly affect people inject drugs. So it's very strongly linked to addiction. And kind of my past experience in the addiction world was sufficient enough to get me that post, and actually helped me kind of settle in quite quickly on that post. Albeit I didn't have the health protection background that some of my colleagues did. And this is the first time I got to work with Sharon and David. So uh, Sharon's here tonight, unfortunately David can't be here tonight. Uh, but we can talk about experts in the field, but Sharon and David are truly world experts in the field. So this was a massive opportunity for me to join this team and, and work with these guys. And it, it's no underestimation for me to say that. I certainly would have got to my professorship if I hadn't have been for the support and the mentorship of, of both these people uh, from this point forward. Now, Sharon and David eh, knew that I had a research background, although a lot of the research I had done was over and above my kind of core day to day role. I used to do a lot of research eh, in evenings and weekends just because I was generally interested in it, but it wasn't necessarily always part of my eh, core day to day role. But they gave me an opportunity eh, after I'd been in the team for six or nine months to formalise eh, that research work that I was interested in into, into an actual eh, research job. And the job they wanted me to take on was to run a, what we call the NESI study. So it's the Needle Exchange Surveillance Initiative. So NESI is a, it's a bio behavioural survey. So the bio bit of NESI is taking a blood spot sample, and that's how we test for bloodborne viruses in this population. And the behavioural is the questionnaire that goes with it that asks people about their drug use behaviours, their service engagement, and a whole host of other questions. Now, I was aware of Nessie because my PhD supervisor at the time, Arnold Taylor, was running Nessie, but she was shortly due to retire and Nessie was moving to GCU. And Sharon and David offered me the chance to take on the kind of day-to-day -day running of Nessie once it moved to GCU. So this was when I became a kind of fully fledged academic, and you can see this is when my job eventually split. I did have the honorary contract from GCU since 2014. This was when I started getting paid for my research work for the first time. It was a real reward of, for really 10 years of graft of doing research over and above, I think, uh, my day to day role that I finally had like, a proper research contract and uh, something I was really delighted with at the time. Uh, so Nessie looks like this. This is a kind of schematic of how Nessie works. I, there's a few Nessie people in the, the audience who either worked on Nessie or Nora who's currently running Nessie, so I'll probably oversimplify this. But <laughs> um, well, essentially we train a group of people uh, and we send them out across the country uh, 
and we send them to places where people inject drugs are likely to present. So typically, community pharmacies or drug treatment services. And then they uh, invite people to take part in the survey. They take the blood spots out from them, ask them some questions. They bring it all back to us. We take the data to the lab, the samples to the lab, and then it comes back to us and we bash all the numbers together and produce these reports uh, and academic papers at the end of it. So it sounds fairly simple. <laughs> uh, it's anything but simple, because we were able to testify to that. But uh, I managed an essay between 2017 and 2020, so I did two sweeps of an essay. So it was two sweeps, about 30 field workers, about 4,500 people who inject drugs recruited over that time. Uh, and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into that for everybody that was involved in it. Uh, but it is a really, really enjoyable project to work with because it's a very lively project. And the way I compare Nessie is to like running an amateur football team. Uh, so I did actually run an amateur football team, we did in front, uh, for our manager left us in limbo because his wife got pregnant about 20 years ago. And uh, we needed somebody to take over the team for a season, so I ran the team for a season. Uh, it was horrendous actually running that team for a season. But it's very similar to running Nessie in terms of there's recruitment issues, there's training issues, you've got to book venues, there's always late call-offs to deal with, uh, weather postponements were a constant feature for that, and in some parts of the country we did uh, uh, feature a lot of difficult opposition. Uh, so yeah, Nessie, the football team gave me good ground to do Nessie, but yeah, this is some of the, the Nessie cohort in the field today. And, uh, yeah, I, I loved managing this. It was a very rewarding piece of work, and some of the guys in the team have either went on to careers in the field or went on to PhDs, and that's been one of the most rewarding parts of this. Bringing the people who had no experience in this area at all, who have ended up embracing this area and, and really working in it, and yeah, it was a really fun uh, study to work in. But at the time, uh, Sharon and David asked me to work on this. Uh, HIV had re-emerged in Glasgow, so there was an HIV outbreak in Glasgow that had been identified. Now, HIV among people who inject drugs had been largely dormant in Scotland for a long period of time. Uh, there was HIV epidemics in the 1980s, which people of a certain vintage will remember, uh, mainly concentrated in Edinburgh and Dundee, not so much in Glasgow because the response for things like methadone and needle syringe exchange were growing quickly enough to avoid the same thing happening in Glasgow. That happened in the east of the country. See this young doctor in the corner, it's Roy Robertson, who was really instrumental in the identification and response in Edinburgh at the time. Roy's here tonight, so I'm delighted the boys come along tonight. He's, he's been a real, uh, a real mentor as well over the course of my career. But uh, there hadn't been anything seen, uh, not just in Scotland, but in the UK for about 30 years. And when HIV was identified in Glasgow, it came on the back of a series of different infectious disease outbreaks in the city affecting people in jet drugs. So around the turn of the century, we did an outbreak of Clusidium mobili, eh, that was followed by an outbreak of anthrax, and then followed by an outbreak of botulism. And these are really horrible, serious infections, affecting largely the same population within the city. Uh, and uh, HIV was the latest uh, to come on the back of that, and really a symptom of the kind of risk environment that these people were either uh, living uh, uh, or uh, residing in. And this is what the HIV outbreak in Glasgow looked like on a graph. Uh, you can see in 2015, we had hardly any cases of HIV amongst this population for a while, and then all of a sudden we had about 50 in the one year, which came out of really nowhere. Uh, and you can see if you draw the line all the way back, this was larger than anything we'd had in the 1980s. This was, a, this was a real kind of serious outbreak that we had to address. And using data from NACI, we were really able to understand the burden of that infection in the wider population. Because when you just look at diagnosis data, you only know about the people you've found. NACI is able to tell us about diagnosed and undiagnosed infections due to the, the wider burden of infection in the population. And you can see over the course of about seven years, HIV infection in Glasgow City Centre it increased tenfold from about 1% to 11%. And this was the largest outbreak of its kind in this population in the UK for over 30 years. <coughs> so what was driving this infection? Where did this come from? Why all of a sudden uh, is HIV spiking in Glasgow? Well, the behavioural part of NACI then told us that. So the bio told us about the problem of infection. The behavioural began to tell us what was driving it. And the main thing that was driving it was a shift to cocaine injection within the city. So if you remember that the NPS injecting example I gave you, there was a shift in Edinburgh towards injecting stimulant there. Cocaine obviously being a stimulant, similar pattern, people now shifting 
towards injecting cocaine. Now, this is typically homeless populations injecting in public places, a population we hadn't really seen as a major cocaine user up until that point, certainly in our population, injecting cocaine. So something in the environment had changed uh, to uh, create this. And because this was such a big thing at the time, uh, the work we did actually we published in Lancet, and Lancet's quite hard to get publications in, so that was a recognition not just of our work, but of the importance of the issue. And the other thing that was interesting at that time was the media kind of seized on it, uh, and this was the kind of first part of my kind of work with the media at GCU, which has become uh, a feature of our work over the last few years, largely thanks to the help of Janice Burns here at the uni. Uh, and interestingly, the media didn't touch the outbreak for the first couple of years, they weren't really interested, they didn't think it was a population that they were uh, bothered about. But the cocaine angle really brought the media in. It was obviously quite a sexy story for the media, uh, and they covered it in droves, not just in the print media, but also in the broadcast media. And this outbreak uh, petered along for, for a few years, it never quite reached the 50 diagnoses. Uh, but as of about now, the outbreak's still not quite officially over. But around 200 people were diagnosed as part of this outbreak. Now, I've heard in some circles people saying 200 is not that big an issue. What's, what's the fuss about? Well, HIV, first of all, is a chronic condition that people they have to live with for the rest of their lives. Of course, it can be treated and managed, but it can't be cured. And HIV is also one of the most stigmatised conditions that people have got to live with in our society. So there was a human element to this amongst a really vulnerable group already. But there's also a financial element to this. <coughs> HIV costs around £300,000 per person to treat across a life course. So this was about a £60 million incident for the health board to manage at a time when public health and finances are not, uh, are, are not rosy. Uh, so this was a major incident that needed a major response. And the response was very uh, multifactorial and involved different agencies, whether it was to do with enhanced reduction, <coughs> increased testing and treatment, including a new treatment model, and lots of new initiatives. I don't have time to go into all of these, unfortunately, but I wanted to draw attention to one aspect of it. Now, this is a paper that's going to come out in the next couple of weeks, and this really looked at specifically the enhanced testing and treatment model. So, HIV treatment at this point of the outbreak being identified was all at Naval. They had to go to get them to the Brown Lane to get the treatment. Now, homeless drug users in the city centre were not going to go to get them to get the treatment. They just didn't have the agency to get there. Uh, and the HIV clinicians kind of turned their own treatment model on their head, took it back into the community within the city centre, and started working collectively with the addictions professionals. And a combination of that, the treatment model and the hard testing, uh, is modelled to have estimated around 300 new HIV infections. So that's potentially a £90 million saving to the board. So it shows you how important that work that Becky and Erica and Lindsay and all their colleagues did and, uh, and how much of a game changer that was. It didn't all go great. There was a new needle exchange opened in response to it in Glasgow Central Station, which quickly became the busiest needle exchange in Scotland at that time. Uh, but then it was closed shortly after because of drug related incidents in the, in the station and it was really kind of productive measure at the time. And then obviously there was a safer drug consumption facility proposed on the back of this outbreak, mm -hmm. which was initially kicked back by the Lord Advocate and then subsequently by the UK government. But thankfully, the new Lord Advocate has seen sense and introduced a new legal framework uh, for that facility to open, and that facility will open uh, later on this year. So, my career path from to the end to 2020, so HPS became Public Health Scotland. Public Health Scotland launched during the pandemic, but they were the greatest team to launch a private organisation. Uh, but this is the only time they launched during the pandemic, we'd be delighted to know. Uh, but during this period, uh, this is where I actually got promoted uh, to reader here at the university and took on uh, some COVID specific roles because a lot of us were repurposed onto the response. But that didn't stop us continuing to do a research in the background here at GCU. And at this point, the research started to pivot back towards drug related deaths. And so, that's um, probably about 45 minutes, but just. Yeah, okay. That's what you get when you give me all that time. I know. <laughs> uh, so, at the time that I worked with Lancashire, if you remember, we had that one day every year, about 350 days, and there was some concern about drug related deaths at the time. 
Fast forward to 2020 and drug related deaths have got much more severe. Mm -hmm. uh, and things have really experienced exponential growth really since 2014 onwards. And Scotland's drug related death rate had become so bad that the only country it was comparable with a population rate internationally was the US. And anybody who follows our popular culture will know that the US has been experiencing its own overdose crisis for the best part of 20 years, fueled by a, a synthetic opioid crisis there. Uh, we don't have that yet in Scotland, but still we had to wait some part with the US. And the media really started to take interest in this down. It being declared a public health emergency at Scottish Parliament. And it wasn't just the national media, it was the international media we had. People like the New York Times on campus actually uh, interviewed us about uh, this phenomenon at that time. I'll quickly go through these because I'm short on time, but we get asked this question all the time about why drug related deaths increased so much in Scotland. And there's no magic for that answer here, but we've come up with this very rapid explanation about the five P's about what we think might be going on in Scotland uh, to drive this. The first thing is poverty. We've talked about poverty before, but you have to recognise that drug related deaths are far more concentrated in the most deprived communities than they are in the least deprived. You're 18 times more likely to die of drug related death if you live in the most deprived communities. And you can see that inequality in drug related deaths is widened over time. So to address drug related deaths fundamentally, you have to address poverty first and foremost. Secondly, in terms of prevalence, if you have a lot of people at risk of death, you're going to get a lot of deaths. In Scotland, per capita has a lot of people at risk of death. And that hasn't changed over time, it's not decreased. So we remain a high prevalence country, and high prevalence countries have high rates of drug related deaths. From a prescribing point of view, drug related deaths are not a new disease that we don't know how to treat or vaccinate. The playbook is quite straightforward in how you respond to these. It's just a matter of how effectively you do put the resources in to respond. And actually, this shows the mortality rates between people on and off opioid agonist entities, typically medical and group and and what this graph shows is that you're far less likely to die if you want treatment. But it also shows that mortality risk has been up for people both on and off treatment. So other interventions are needed and we also need to look at why uh, the treatment system is not performing as effectively as it might be able to. And then poly drug use, we've talked about uh, a lot already about the type of substances used. But just to simplify this, you can see back in 2008, it was a very small number of combinations, so you're looking for thicker black lines to see the combinations of drugs that people were dying from. By 2020, there's lots more black, thick lines emerging here, and the evidence of drugs like gabapentinoids and cocaine uh, coming into the mix here. People were much more likely to be taking more different combinations of drugs, which was increasing the risk. And if you've got a toxic drug supply, which has been largely replaced by illicit substances rather than prescribed substances, you're likely to get high mortality rates. And this is where we see the comparison between the US and Scotland really stand out. The US is driven by a synthetic opioid toxicity. Our one initially was to, uh, driven by a, a street benzodiazepine, illicit benzodiazepine toxicity that was driving that. And in policy, there is a few policy people in the audience tonight who didn't want to put too much politics in. But I think it's fair to say that the policy response on this issue was slow. Uh, and even the government themselves conceded that their policy response had been slow. Uh, it, had been, it took too, well, too long for it to be prioritised, and that's not just at Holyrood, but that was also uh, at Westminster as well, because this is a new key issue. Since then, the response has been good. There's lots of new policies that have come in, and there's lots of prioritisation in this area. And people have been getting quite excited because drug related death numbers came down last year quite a lot eh, for the first time in a long time. Eh, but I think we warned against over interpreting one year's worth of data. And certainly the, the intelligence we've got for 2023 suggests that that decline is not going to be long lasting eh, at the moment. And that's because the drug use environment and the injecting environment is really dynamic and it's changing. We've had uh, major changes in the opium harvest in Afghanistan because of Taliban influence. Uh, it's down 95% and that's paved the way for synthetic opioids coming into the market uh, in the Europe and UK. We're now seeing uh, slowly but surely the emergence of uh, drugs like nephazines come in which are much more toxic. Similarly, drugs like xylazine are now being detected. And then the elephant in the room is the cocaine injecting which continues to get bigger and bigger. And the latest data we have from the NICE study suggests that more people are injecting cocaine now in Glasgow than are injecting heroin, and that again is something I don't 
think we could have forecast uh, 10 years ago. So that was my journey to Professor and that's got us up to the present day. And uh, I'd just like to thank everybody who's helped me get there all the way and hopefully that wasn't too uh, much of a <laughs> Just now, or we would see much more people presenting it 
AME or an R service is just now because of that is in use, but it is kind of creeping in and something you need to be aware of. And naloxone is part of the response effect in this disease. It just might require more naloxone administrations than you would have to give to a kind of traditional uh, heroin overdose, for example, and that's the message going out just now. It's like naloxone is still effective, but you might have to give a bit more uh, than you're normally given. So I think that is the message that's been put out by our reduction services just now, but also at the same time still encouraging people to treat them because that's the most effective way to prevent these things in the first place. I worked in addiction for a while and I, I remember thinking, um, I'm right away with us, and I remember thinking for, for a while, cocaine is definitely there in the room here and we're not really addressing it. It's like the like services are set up for heroin, services are getting better at being with diazepine use, but we don't really talk about cocaine injection and I think it's because we don't really know what to offer people. We don't know... Um, we can see if you go, if you try methadone, if you try um, Puvidam, if you try this, but we don't really know what, what to see if you've got other than other and need of exchange. And, and I think that's a difficulty that I've observed and when I was um, in practice in addiction. Yeah, I think that's entirely for common. I don't think there is an obvious solution sitting on the shelf, yeah. but there's some experimental solutions, and I think we'll be reluctant to maybe engage with some of those experimental solutions, and maybe that's where people like myself and others come in to kind of maybe support research on some of these experimental solutions and I think there's some movement down south uh, to do that now and I think hopefully places in Glasgow or uh, other parts of the country experiencing this can get involved in that. So to say that it always works, methadone that comes with its own problems doesn't yeah. it, but I think it's just that well, I don't want to bring it up because I don't really know what it's going to be. Um, so I think we may have time for one more, if anyone has another question. I blame Andy for keeping us back from session. <laughs> yes. Uh, everybody just asked him what's the most question, so I'm going to ask him an Andy question. Um, <laughs> what's the thing you've been most proud of, the work you've been most proud of? Brutal <laughs> 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 question. Uh, I don't know, I think uh, that is a hard question. Do you know what? I wait for this back on you, so Matt and I. <laughs> uh, Matt and I worked on the heroin assisted treatment service evaluation uh, together, and we, we set all that up and we launched it in December 2019. And we had this big plan about how we were going to do that evaluation. And then the pandemic hit, and it basically kiboshed everything we'd set up to do because we weren't allowed anywhere near the service. And we'd all this ethnographic stuff worked out, we were going to be in situ and observing everything. Uh, we weren't allowed to do it. So it became uh, a remote study. And actually, a lot of people doing research at that time either just stopped or postponed what we were doing. But actually, we dug in and kind of kept doing what we were doing, and we managed to get that project. It was a very, very challenging environment uh, to work in, and we got that project to completion. So that might not be my most proudest moment, but it's certainly one of my most proudest moments that we got through that to the end and delivered a kind of final piece of research, which working with the guys who ran that service and the patients who, who were involved in that service is now kind of feeding into other kind of service design, not just for that service, but like the drug consumption room, for example, as well. So yeah, that's probably one of the ones that's up to Good answer, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to the, the end of our session um, tonight. So I'd like to um, thank Professor Andy McCauley again. Um, before we give him a round of applause, just to see um, the drinks reception is just um, if you go out the door just to the left there's just there's some signs up. Um, but like join with me and just once more saying well done.